So hello, every, everyone. Um, thanks for joining us. My name is Kristen, and I am the event specialist within Circle. Uh, we're excited to kick off our webinar, Leadership and Restoration, with our amazing panelists, Eric, Lisa, and Patrick. So today's webinar is going to take us to about 1.30, um, and we'll walk you through a practical framework to motivate your field teams and capture the field documentation that's required in this industry. Uh, if you're a field team lead, a project manager, a restoration business owner looking to solve the complex problem of inconsistent documentation, you are in the right place. Uh, this is not an Encircle app training. However, if you are looking for support, you can always reach out to us at success at encircleapp.com. We've also got a special offer from RTI to get access to their amazing contents uh, and field documentation checklists. So after the event closes, there will be a survey to uh, click the check the checkbox to opt in. Now I'll hand it over to each of our panelists to introduce themselves. So we'll start with Lisa, um, and then Eric, and then Patrick. Hi, everybody. Thank you for joining us. My name is Lisa Lavender. I've been in this industry for over 24 years. I love operations, training, working with other restorers, developing resources that help us all enjoy the amazing opportunities in this industry. But I am also a self-proclaimed restoration poet. And so I actually wanted to kick us off with my very first poem ever that I wrote. And it's an ode to documentation. Documentation can cause much frustration. Pictures and notes are the key as you do restoration with great glee. If it is a water job, the data and readings you must log. Do not skip or you'll have a blip as documentation thorough and complete will make your company hard to beat. It's tough for me to follow that act. Thank you, Lisa. I'm Eric Berglund. I don't have a poem for you. I'm the founder of the language of leadership. I'm really focused on what do you say and how do you say it in those most challenging leadership moments. And it's a fun uh, partnership between me, RTI, Lever360, and of course, in circle here to bring that to you today. So thank you for having me. And I'm Patrick Detweiler, uh, production manager at Burke's Firewater Restorations. Um, I've been in the restoration industry now about 10 years, and I manage all the company's resources at Burke's Firewater, meaning all the field staff. So documentation is a big thing with what I do. So. Well, thank you again for being here. This is Leadership and Restoration. It's really how to get your team to do the damn documentation thing. We're going to start this thing off with a little skit. Let me know if this sounds familiar to you in your world at all. We're going to pretend that Pat's one of my technicians here. Hey, Pat, hey, I noticed on the, the job you just submitted that we're missing some photos. Do you have those on your phone somewhere? Oh, man, I was busy and I totally forgot to upload those photos. Does this sound familiar to anybody at all? It should. How do you handle that conversation is exactly what we're here to say. So, Pat just shared with me that uh, he forgot to get him. So my question back, hey, Pat, when did you realize in that moment, as you think about yesterday when you're supposed to grab them, when did you realize you didn't have those photos? Probably when I was driving back to the shop from the job. Yeah, that happens, man. So in that moment where, where you realized you weren't going to have the photos, what did you do then? I just, I forgot and I panicked and I just didn't know what to do. Fair enough. If you think back on it, what could you have done? What options would you have had to make sure you still were able to finish that? Maybe if I could have put like a sticky note on my dashboard, just saying upload, finish the photos, I would have remembered. Yeah, that would have helped a lot. I like that idea. And we do need those in order to make sure we get paid properly on this project. Can you reach back out to the homeowner, make sure you actually go get those photos that we need? I'll do it right now. Cool. Thank you. We're going to do a lot of little skits like that. And if you're listening to them, you're going to hear that, yeah, we're shortening them. We're going to make them a little easier than they might feel or sound in your real life. But we want to use real life examples to demonstrate what it actually sounds like to say these things, to have these conversations. We want to make it look and sound and feel like the situations you're presented in. As you hear them, I want you to feel encouraged. Ask questions. Say, what if? What about this? What about that? We may not be able to engage with all of it, but we will capture it in Q&A and try to do our best along the way. I want to start out by letting you know this morning that you are in the right place and you're going to be learning a ton from us here today. So we're going to put a poll up in chat here. Kristen, if you can put our first poll up, I'm going to get a sense of what actually brought you in here today. But I want to start by letting you know you're in the right place this morning if you regularly find yourself doing other people's jobs. Meaning if you had an example like Pat and I just went through and you would regularly be the person who would then go get the photo yourself, that might be the problem that you're struggling with. That would be an awesome reason for you to be here today. 
Another good reason for you to be here today would be if you feel like you're an adult babysitter, if you feel like you have to remind people to do the things they're supposed to do. In fact, every time you assign something to somebody, your to-do list grows as well. That'd be another really good reason for you to be with us here. Maybe you're struggling to develop talent. You're trying to, get, you're having a hard time getting your people to hear your feedback, uh, your correction, those types of things. You're noticing that they aren't progressing at the pace they need to. Maybe they've even turned into a problem child, somebody who's, uh, a chronic underperformer. Maybe they don't belong on the bus anymore. Maybe they're awesome at the job, but they bring the morale down on the team, something along those lines. That would be another really good reason to be here today. I want you to take a second. Let us know in that poll, what really has you here today? Which version of that do you struggle with the most? We're going to get those results coming in. I'm not going to pause for them just right out of time's sake. I guess another answer here would be all of the above. If you're struggling with each and every one of these, that'd be an okay answer for us as well. But I want to let you know, these are real problems, but they're not the real core problem. Oh, I see some results coming in. All of the above, pretty, pretty common there. Adult babysitting seems to be the lead horse on its own. These are all real problems, but I got to let you know, they're actually just symptoms. The real problem has to do with this word accountability. And I mean that in three different ways. It has to do with, you don't have a culture where it's normal for your people to follow through on all the things they're supposed to, where, where it's normal for them to be highly accountable. And you may not know what to do and say in those moments when they aren't. That's what we're here to talk about today. And because it's not normal for you to hold your people accountable like this, it would feel really weird. In fact, it may feel antagonistic or confrontational, and that it creates even more resistance to accountability. That's the core issue we're here to address. These are just the symptoms of that core problem. Now, I struggled with all of these problems. I led a sales team in the construction industry. I had 16 direct reports, very slippery, verbal jujitsu guys who could talk their way out of anything. And I struggled with each and every one of these problems. But when I got good at what I'm going to share with you here today, everything changed. And that's the key I'm going to ask you to focus on is getting good at this. Look, knowledge is cool, but skill is way cooler. You knowing what to say is not the same as your ability to say it calmly and confidently the way that you want to. When you get good at these skills, that's what actually allows you to address the core problem rather than just consistently feeling beat on by the symptoms and challenges that you have here. I'm excited to have you here. Today, you're going to learn how to get your team members to do their own jobs and how to create an environment where they value your input and your feedback. You're going to learn how to address that performance issue, attitude, et cetera, that you're struggling with. And you're going to get some tips on effective training or how to set your people up to be successful. You're going to learn how to hold your people accountable. What do you do? What do you say in the moments, just like Pat just demonstrated, when they didn't do what they were supposed to? And how do you set them up to be more accountable, to prevent those issues from happening? Because ounces of prevention is way better than pounds of cure. You're going to get some practical ways to handle the excuses that you're going to hear, because we all know once you start down this road, you're going to get excuses from your people. I'm going to give you a playbook for that. When you learn how to do these things well, you're going to get a tremendous amount of your time back. And that's what I want for you more than anything, your time and your sanity to come back at you here. Once I learned how to do these things, my performance shot through the roof. Again, I led a sales team, but we were already doing well. And when I learned how to hold my people accountable, our performance doubled. I developed a team of rock stars and I was free to go do all the big strategic things I should have been doing for months, quarters, or years. More importantly to me though, is I got my time and my headspace back. I have two beautiful daughters. I have an amazing wife. I have a community I love investing my time into, but I couldn't be who I needed to be when I was dealing with all of those symptoms all the time. When I was cracking my laptop on nights and weekends, I couldn't be who I needed to be as a husband, a father, and a friend. By learning how to hold people accountable, I got my time and my headspace back. And I was able to take the next steps in my career. And look, I'm not saying you all need to move to Bend, Oregon. That's where I'm coming at you from. Or that you need to come be a leadership coach. I in fact, I don't recommend that for most people. But the next step in your career, either your individual career or the growth of your company, probably requires you to be able to hold people accountable. And if you can develop this skill, you open up the ability for you to take that next step. So we're going to put another poll in chat here. Kristen, if you wouldn't mind, I'm curious to get a sense of your motivation here. What really drives you more? Is it improved, imp is it improved performance? Is it that time and headspace back, that sanity is it the next steps in your career or maybe an organizational change? Sometimes that's a big driver. I didn't put it on one of my slides, but that's another good one. Take a second. Let us know here what's motivating to you to develop these skills. We're going to keep marching on here. Today, I'm going to share three secrets with you that are going to allow you to take the next step in those directions. Okay, and I'm sharing these out of my program called The Language of Leadership. I call it The Language of Leadership because that's what I believe leadership is. It's a language. It's what you say and how you say it that's going to allow you to effectively influence your people. I'm going to share three secrets out of the program here with you today. There's a lot more in it. 
but I'm gonna give you three good ones. Number one, you can build a healthy culture of accountability by using a systematic and positive focus on accountability. You can make that change. Secret number two is that it's a lot easier for your people to be accountable if you're excellent at setting expectations. In fact, the vast majority of the accountability issues that you struggle with stem from improperly conveyed uh, expectations. I'm gonna show you how to clean that up. And the last secret I'm gonna share with you here today is that everybody makes excuses, yourself included. And once you understand that, I'm gonna teach you a little play that you can learn to handle those excuses so that you don't worry about them again. I'm not saying they're gonna go down to zero, you're gonna see less. But what I am saying is you don't worry about it anymore because you'll know what to do and say in those moments. Those are the three secrets I'm gonna share with you here today. We're gonna to jump right into it just to make sure we're on time here. By starting out, there is a systematic and positive way to hold your people accountable. Look, my journey into accountability began in 2016. I led that sales team I mentioned, 16 people, three states, they were doing well, but I was struggling with all the symptoms that we all identified with a little bit earlier. I would have been somebody who said, ear, I got all of the above. And so I was trying to leave the company. I actually was, you know, the grass must be greener somewhere else. It can't be me. I'm an awesome leader. So I was trying to leave. And I found myself in this final interview sitting across from a CEO of this company I wanted to work for. And he asked me one question that led to the creation of this entire program and also completely devastated me. You can imagine sitting there in this interview, I feel like I'm pretty good at this. And he asked me this one question and it swept the legs right out from underneath me. The simple question that he asked me, Vincent, was how do you hold your people accountable? And by the way, if you lead leaders, if you interview managers, that's a hell of a question to ask them because you'll probably stump them just as much as I got stumped. In that moment, he asked me that one question, how do you hold your people accountable? And I had no answer for him. I said, oh, I've got good incentive plans. My people should be really motivated, right? I know sometimes we say things like, well, I give them chips or beer or I give them raises or you know, we come up with all sorts of incentives that should be motivating to them. And I said, oh, I've got good systems and processes so that I can track what they're supposed to do and know when they aren't accountable. But- I didn't know what the heck to say or do when they weren't. What do you do when they don't do it, do it later, do it poorly? That's what I realized in that moment I had no answer for. So I came back, I started asking other leaders that and other leadership questions or accountability questions like, well, what does an accountable person even do? First, I realized nobody else had a good answer for the accountability thing either. So what does an accountable person even do? Most of you, if I polled you, would say, well, an accountable person does what they say they're gonna do. You'd give me some version of that answer. They follow through, they're committed, whatever it might be. But that's where I found the primary problem to exist. We have this binary perspective on what accountability is. Did they do it or didn't they do it? And our anxiety over whether they're going to do it or not is what promotes us to do the adult babysitting thing, right? That's what causes you to be like, well, they dropped the ball the last four times. I should probably go remind them. And if they don't do it, the only tools that are at your disposal are those that have been used on you. You might take a second and reflect on how have you been held accountable in your career? I don't know about you, but for me, it was always negative. School, sports, college, early jobs, parents. The tools used on me to hold me accountable were a chastising, a finger wagging, a disciplinary action, a make me feel bad enough that I never repeat the same type of mistake again. Those are the typical tools that we know how to use. And if you compound that with lack of time and frustration, those are the readily available tools that we use. Well, no wonder we have a negative association with accountability. It's a four-letter word in most organizations. There's this saying that, People who've never been held accountable before, accountability feels like or persecution. That's true. If you've never experienced it in a positive way, you don't like it. And we need a better definition to make it something you can build a culture around. I want you to take a second real, real, fly, or real quick. We're going to put another poll in chat. Why don't you just think, take a second and think through this real quick. On a scale of one to 10, 10 is high, one is low. How good are you at consistently and confidently holding everyone on your team accountable? And that last word's really critical. I want you to understand before you put a number in there, if you let Bob slide, you undermine the whole culture. No offense to anybody named Bob in here. I'm gonna use that name a couple of times as an example. But if you let one or two people in your team slide, you consistently lower the accountability of everybody else. You, there's, it creates a toxin in the organization. So take a second, I understand, scale of one to 10, how consistently and confidently do you hold everybody on your team accountable? Let's get a baseline in here if we can. And then I want you to take a second and think, what if you were better at it? I don't mean amazing at it tomorrow. I just mean better, right? A couple points more than your current score. What would you? What would be different in your world? Think about it. It's it's like almost August. We're halfway through, or over halfway through this new year here, which is insane. What would be different? You've spent a lot of time covering for people this year. You've spent a lot of time doing other people's jobs. You've opened your laptop on nights and weekends. You felt a lack of confidence quite often. What would be different if you were good at it? Because that's what we're really here talking about today.
I see the poll results coming in. We got a pretty healthy bell curve looking thing going on there. Standard distribution, it seems like. But look, wherever you are on that, you're in the right spot today because you're going to learn a few skills that are going to help you level up a couple points. It starts, getting better at this starts by changing your definition of accountability. See, I too think that an accountable person does what they say they're going to do. I just expect them to fail a decent amount of times. Not because I think lowly of human beings. I just think we put them in complex situations, especially in your business. You literally have all sorts of shit happening all day long and your people have to adapt to it. Like people are going to struggle. It's what they do when they struggle that decides if they're accountable or not. I think an accountable person does what they say they're going to do, but when they can't, they proactively communicate it to stakeholders. They self-diagnose the nature of the miss or the failure and they solve for the future. That's the four-step process I expect a person to follow to be accountable so what do you do to actually hold them accountable? Well, to hold those people accountable, you need to ask them a series of questions to support them through that process. Meaning each and every time they don't do what they're supposed to, you need to have a consistent toolbox that you go to, to create a conversation with them that makes them live through that process. This one right here, a series of questions you ask each and every time to make them live through this four-step process is what you do to hold your people accountable. I'm going to jump into this question, those questions in just a second. But before I do, I want to make some point clear here. Every time you cover for one of your people and go get the photos yourself or call the homeowner yourself or send somebody from the office to go get a signature, you're reinforcing the bad behavior of those people and you're conditioning them to not be accountable. And what I'm putting in front of you today is a different play to condition them in a different way. When you hold your people accountable in this way, three powerful things happen. Number one, because you're consistent, they will adapt their behavior to you. Meaning instead of you adapting to each and every one of their excuses and nuances and covering for them in all the ways that you do, they're going to adapt to you. And they're going to know what's coming from you, what questions are coming and how you're going to ask them. So you'll create more accountability in the future just by your sheer cons uh, consistency. The second thing that's going to happen is you're going to help your people level up their skill and their commitment each time they fail. You might simply notice that skill plus commitment equals performance. We're trying to get better performance out of our people. You need to level up their skill and their commitment. And the last thing is you're going to reassign the work back to them so they finish the job because it's their job and not yours. So what are those questions? Well, the first question we got to ask is, did they do it or not? If you ever feel like uh, your people are frustrated at you, you're micromanaging by asking if they did their dang job or not, you're not. You've heard it here now. You can take that off the table. The first thing in holding somebody accountable is asking them if they did what they're supposed to do. We're here because they're going to say, no, I didn't. I forgot, whatever it might be. And what we're not going to do is play into our standard conditioning, which is to say, okay, I'll go get it for you or something along those lines. Instead, you heard me do this with Pat earlier. My first question after somebody tells me they didn't do the thing they were supposed to do or did it late is to ask them this. Hey, Pat, when did you realize you weren't going to be able to get that done? Now, I want you to notice the word I use here matters, but the tone I use matters more. You heard it in the example earlier. What I didn't say was, Pat, when did you realize you weren't going to have the dang photos, man? You know you need those. Nobody responds well to that. We know this. We're frustrated. I get it. But nobody responds well in the doghouse. They don't learn anything. I'm trying to get into Pat's brain and help him uncover the commitment issue that led him to failing. And in this instance, he bailed on it halfway on the drive home. He realized it, but he didn't do anything about it. I'm trying to change that commitment level. And if I can ask this in a sincere way, hey, Pat, when did you realize you weren't going to be able to get it done, man? We might have a real conversation in which I can challenge him in the way that you overheard me do before. Then I can ask the skill question. Hey, Pat, if you think about what caused you to fail, what was it? And you might say, oh, I forgot. And you heard him promote his own idea. Maybe I could use a sticky note. Cool. I'm going to try to help this person uncover what caused them to fail, but I'm going to try to get them to tell me. I don't want to tell them because if I tell them, they don't have ears for that. You ever try to tell your people what they're bad at? None of us are ready to hear that. But if I can get Pat to share with me what he struggled with, we can help him get better at it. Then I'm going to ask him to solve for the future. What can you do next time? How do you make sure this doesn't hang you up again next time? And last, I'm going to reassign the work back to him. Can you go get that done now? Look, we can't go back in time. There's some deadlines they can't go back and hit. But anything else, make them go finish the job. The best way to get an adult to change their behavior is to make them live with the consequences of their own failure. And that doesn't mean firing them. It just means making them call the homeowner, making them go back and get it, making them drive out there or crack their laptop on the nights and weekends. If you don't do this last step, you undermine it, the whole thing. If you cover for them once, they know you're going to cover for them next time. 
This is how you consistently hold people accountable by asking them this series of questions each and every time. One of the things you're going to get in the opt-in is a playbook that shows you this exact play. What are the questions? How do I ask them? That's included in the opt-in. I want to make sure you have that. Most of you haven't been held accountable in this way, but I got to let you know, this is how excellent leaders consistently and confidently hold people accountable. And they get good at it because they practice it. Leadership is a skill. If you just wait to do it in real life, you're going to struggle. But if you spend a little bit of time practicing it in a safe space, you're going to find you can develop that skill and get good at it. That's one of the other options for you to, to be included in the opt-in here is a, a chance to practice. You might take a second and think, why would now be the right time for you to get good at this? Now, you don't have to answer that in chat, but I want you to think about it. It's July. It's August, actually. What the heck do you want to be different in Q2, or excuse me, Q3 or Q4 that wasn't that way in Q1 and Q2? It probably stems in your ability to hold people accountable. All right, I know we blitzed through that, but I want to make sure we get a little chance to do a little skit, work through this stuff here. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to open up a different skit here that you may sound more familiar as well. Hey, Pat, I noticed that there's no signed emergency service authorization on the job you went to yesterday. Do you have that? I must have lost in the paperwork. I totally forgot about it. Sorry, dude. Yeah, I understand. Hey, but when did you realize you weren't going to be able to get that uh, included? When did that? When, when I got back to the shop, I was going through paperwork and I saw I didn't have it. Okay. And when you realized you didn't have the paperwork that we know we need, like, what did you do then? How did you try to overcome that? Um, I didn't do anything. I just forgot. <laughs> okay. So in the future, we need to make sure we get that to us. So what can you do next time in order to make sure you're able to get that ESA? Because otherwise we can't proceed on these jobs. What I need to do is before I leave the job, just go through everything real quick in my truck to make sure it's all there before I head back. Yeah, that's going to be really necessary. Can you go get that? We, we still need that ESA. Otherwise, we, we really can't even be doing work. We're proceeding at risk. What can you do to make sure you actually get that thing signed here and get it back to me? I'm going to call the homeowner right now, see if they're home and go get it signed. Cool. Appreciate that. Again, I know Pat's playing very nicely in the sandbox here, but it's only to demonstrate the skill set there. You're going to hear excuses, all that stuff. That's why we're going to go through it. But that is what it sounds like to hold somebody accountable. I mean, if you can control your tone through it, you're going to get a lot better responses from people. You're going to learn a lot more and help that person make the changes to their process or procedure or whatever it was that led to failure. So Pat, you've been practicing in the language of leadership. Lisa's a student in the program as well. Maybe you could share briefly, what have you taken out of your time in learning how to hold people accountable and how has it changed you and your organization? So it's given a lot of my time back. And I will say, when you first start holding people accountable, like Eric's right, when you start saying, hey, we're going to hold our teams accountable, everybody's kind of like deer in headlights, like, oh my God, like what's going to happen now? And people immediately go to like disciplinary write-ups, you know, verbal warnings, we're taking away vehicles they, they think it's so negative and being in the academy and practicing this and learning like the verbiage it's less it's less threatening to your field staff it's you realize like you're investing in them and when you invest in them they see you like you want better for them and i realized there's so much time i took away from them or how much i held back because i was doing their job for them um and being in the academy it's like i'm able to then practice like He's not kidding when he says about these scripts. I see some of these guys saying how, you know, his tone and everything. It's because the more you practice it, the more you're prepared for it. When you go to talk to somebody, the easier it gets. And it's been helping. I'm glad it's been so effective for you, Pat. It's been awesome to have you in the program. Could you comment on um, any internal feeling of confidence or the anxiety level you had versus what you have now when someone doesn't do what they're supposed to or not? Is that something that's changed at all in you? I used to hate having to go to somebody after they didn't do their job. And especially in the world we live in, because it's just, you know, I didn't want to come down on them. I was trying to help them. And here, sometimes I would end up being too nice and I wasn't really holding them accountable. Then I ended up doing their job and their job becomes my job and I start losing more time. And now the more I've done it, the more confident I feel. And it just, it, feels more comfortable having these conversations with my people. And it's just easier. The more you do it, the easier it is. And they also see it coming now too, because they've heard the same script a couple of times. Well, you've done a great job of implementing it. You've grown a lot in that way. And it's a testament to your consistency that you're seeing them reacting differently. That's always the high sign, right? We can talk about this all we want. But if your people start changing their behavior, that's when you know it's actually working. So great job, Pat. It's awesome to have you in the program. We're going to move on to secret number two. Lisa, anything to chime in on? 
No, I agree with everything Pat said. The only thing I would add is I love that if anybody has the opportunity to do the academy as a team, I think that really helped me and Patrick because we could, in between our practice sessions, uh, we held each other accountable to making sure we're using the language of leadership, but we also were able to practice um, in real life situations. So we really enjoyed being together through it. Yeah, getting a few of you in there that you can actually kick around the real examples together and be honest about them and wrestle with them and share things maybe that you don't get to share otherwise has been great. Highly recommend the same thing. If you have a chance to get your whole organization of leadership to take it, you'll you'll grow so much from it really quickly. Let's jump into our second secret. I see some other Q&A going on in there. I haven't, I'm not going to take any time to answer those yet, but just feel free. Keep adding questions. Look, one other reality to all of this is you all look, sound, and feel differently than I do, right? I'm a dude from the Pacific Northwest. I'm going to say this differently than you are right now. One of the advantages of practicing this stuff is customizing it, making it yours. Make, if you're from the Northeast, especially, we're going to talk different, buddy. If you're from the South, we're going to talk different about these things. You're going to learn how to customize it if you practice it a little bit. So even as you're hearing it come out of my mouth, if it doesn't sound like you, that's good. It won't. But the framework is something you'll be able to take and apply. And the next piece I want to share with you here is that it's a lot easier to get your people to be accountable. If you're excellent at setting expectations, in fact, the vast majority of the challenges that we face with our people stem from improperly communicated expectations. We're going to dive into that a little bit here. Let me know if this situation sounds familiar to you at all. You're going about your day and you finally have some time for yourself. You're like, yes, I'm going to get some stuff done. And then one of your people comes up to you out of nowhere and they need your help. And it's an urgent thing always, or it's a fire, or it's a really critical thing. And, you know, they say, what do I do, boss? How do I handle this situation? And you're a good boss. You're a caring person. You put on your chief problem solver hat. And you say, okay, here's what you need to do. And you lay it out as clearly as possible. Maybe there's a clearly known best practice. Maybe there's not. You're just kind of, you know, generally what needs to be done. But you're saying it so clearly with them. You need to go do X, Y, and Z. And they're like, you got it, boss. I'm going to go do that exact thing. No problem. And then they go do something completely freaking different. And somehow or another, they're proud of it. You ever have that one where your people actually come back and they think they've done a really good job, even though they did like barely any of the things that you clearly communicated to them that they need to do. And then depending on how much coffee you've had that day or how frustrated you are with that individual, you react. But what's going on in your brain a lot of times is like, how the hell did we get here? Like, what is, am I taking crazy pills? How did this happen? That happens to us all the time. And if we want to understand why it happens, we need to dive a little bit deeper so that we can fix it here. Now, we tend to think this happens as an accountability issue with this person. That person wasn't very accountable. But I want to draw your attention to the reality that go back to our definition of accountability. An accountable person does what they say they're going to do, what they say they're going to, not what they hear. People are way more accountable to what they say than what they hear. And if this feels like a minor semantic argument to you, I got to let you know it's not. It's a psychological trigger. If you can get somebody to say what they're going to do, they're more likely to do it. If all they do is hear, it's open to a lot of interpretation and their commitment level is going to be much lower. The second reason that happens, and I hate to point fingers, but you may have conditioned them this way. I know Pat well enough to know that I can use this as an example. Pat, there were a bunch of people that would go do the wrong job and then you would cover it for them. And they thought that was the play they were supposed to run. To them, they're like, job well done. I got it 80%. Pat finished it. Everybody's happy. We condition our people. And if you're used to doing their jobs for them, especially for those of you who filled that out in the survey earlier and said, hey, I'm, you know, I'm always doing other people's jobs for them. You're conditioning your people that you'll cover for them. This may be what they think they're supposed to do. The third reason this happens is it's very easy to use the same words, but mean different things. And we can't read each other's minds. I'm going to use a super stupid example here, but I promise you it's highly effective at making this point. There's like 200 and some of you on this, on this uh, webinar here. If I asked each one of you to picture a dog right now, I know it's a weird example, but bear with me. Take a second, picture a dog or look across the office at Fido, whatever's going on. There's, there's enough people on here that if I use this three letter word, some of you are thinking closer to a Chihuahua and some of you are thinking closer to a Great Dane. And somewhere in there's a lot of opportunity for us to be wildly disappointed if we think we're having the same conversation about the same dog. In the business world, this example is, tends to be the word done. What does the word done really mean to our people? This seems to be highly subjective. If I say I need it done on Friday, Lisa, does that mean it's in my inbox at 8.30 in the right format, ready to go present to the board? Or... Does it mean I get a smattering of nonsense in the body of an email at 5.30 p.m. on a Friday, which means I have to spend my Monday morning cleaning it up? 
It's easy to use the same words, but mean different things. And since we can't read each other's minds, we need a better process if we're going to get on the same page. So that's what we need. This process is called the three C's. Clarity, confirmation, and commitment. Clarity are the details. They're the age, sex, and breed of the dog so that we know we're talking about the same dang thing. Commit, or excuse me, confirmations when they say it back to you. So we flip that psychological trigger and confirm that they're going to do the right things. And a commitment to a timeline. Their real commitment to their real timeline is what it takes for us to verify we actually are going to get this thing done. So here's what that example could sound like. Your people come to you. Oh, wait, excuse me, I forgot. Let's be super clear about this. It requires you to also understand your own expectations. And sometimes we don't have the best organization about what we really do expect from people. In this world, it means you really need to understand what type of data they need to be recording and when it needs to be recorded. We need to have a communicated the expectations that these are the pieces of information we're going to need within a certain amount of time. We're going to need photos that have a point of reference so we can understand the size and scale and scope of things. Sometimes it's going to include pre-existing conditions, equipment in place, you know, an overview of each room or whatever it might be. These are the types of details that if they aren't clearly communicated to your people, it's even easier for you to be on opposite pages. So what could this sound like? Now, I want to be super clear about this too. I'm using this as a reactionary tool right now. This is something we can use when we go to delegate too. I'm just demonstrating it as if the person came up to you to solve their problem. This time, Pat's going to come up to me and say, hey, Eric, what do I do? How do I you know, solve this problem for me, boss? And I'm going to resist the temptation to put on my chief problem solver hat here. And instead, I'm going to say something along these lines. Hey, Pat, I got a couple ideas, man. I'm happy to share them with you, but you're closer to this than one, I'm not, this one than I am, and, and I trust you. What's your opinion? You know, how would you approach it? What are you thinking? I want you to, again, notice my tonality here. This is a critical component of this. You are conditioned from birth to understand tonality and body language instantly. You know when you walk into a certain room based on the way somebody squares up to you, the volume they use, the tone they use when they're communicating to you, you know where you're at in that conversation before the words have even registered. My tonality is what's going to get Pat to play along in the sandbox here more than the words themselves. What I'm not saying is, well, Pat, what's your solution going to be? How are you going to take care of that? That's not bad. I just want you to notice that that conveys to Pat that there's a right answer and a wrong answer. And most of our people get tired of our damn tests, so they don't play anymore. They stop answering and they just start saying, well, Pat knows the answer anyway. I might as well just wait till he tells me what he wants me to do. And that conditions them to be very lazy. So instead, I'm going to say, Pat, look, I got a couple ideas, man. I'm happy to share them with you, but you live with this every day and I don't. Now, what's your opinion? How are you thinking about it? Upward tones, softer language, like opinion or, or opportunity or uh, opinion or, or thinking about it. And that's what's going to get people to maybe open up to you. Because that's what I want. I want Pat to share his idea on what he's supposed to do here. Because if I can make it his idea, three powerful things are no, will happen. Number one, it'll be his. We like our own ideas. We champion them. We fight for them. We defend them. We get really bored when our boss drones on about their ideas. So if we can make it theirs to begin with, they're going to be more likely to go and get further down that road. The second thing that happens is because it's their idea, everything we do to modify it, to help them improve it, they like more. We like it when people improve our ideas. Again, we get real bored at the boss droning on and the nuance or details of theirs. That's how you do talent development well, by the way. For those of you that had the talent development in the bar there or in, this, in the survey, figuring out where they're trying to go and helping them improve their ability to get there, that's what talent development largely revolves around. The last thing that's going to happen, I'm back to this word, we're going to condition our people that they need to come to us with ideas and solutions instead of problems. I got so much of my time back when my people started coming to me with ideas and solutions instead of what do I do, boss? That's a wildly different dialogue. It's much faster and a lot more effective. All this is going to happen simply because I use the right tonality to get Pat to convey his idea or opinion to me. Now, what if it's a terrible idea? That's okay. Don't panic. Don't worry. You're going to hear a lot of terrible ideas from your people. But I can just say, hey, look, I see a couple of ways I could help. Could I share them with you real quick? Again, my tonality isn't going to convey that you did something wrong. I'm just going to try to enhance what you've already done. And almost nobody says no to that question. And then I can either ask them good open-ended questions that might begin with who, what, when, where, or how to help them think through their own problem. Or I might need to be really direct and tell that person exactly what they need to do. But now we have unambiguous clarity and they've taken a stab at it themselves. We know what needs to be done. But I don't know what's going to be done until they confirm it back to me. So I need to ask, hey, Pat, now that we've chatted through it a little bit, man, what are you hearing? What are you taking away? What's your plan going to be now? I'm going to get him to confirm what he heard and is going to do 
so we can decide if it's the right thing or not. It's really helpful to know on day zero, minute zero, that your person was about to go screw it up. So if you can hear them say the right things, they're far more likely to go and do it. And because they said it, you flip the psychological trigger. And since they said it, you can now hold them accountable to it. We have confirmation from them. Then we needed commitment. When can you go and get that? Take a look at your calendar. When are you going to be able to tackle that? What's on your production sheet this week? When would you be able to fit that in? I'm going to start from a position of respect to try to get that person to actually share with me when they think they would be able to get it done so that I can get a sense of when they actually think they could do it done instead of me jamming it into their world. Now, I may need it sooner. Pat may tell me, Eric, I can't get that to you until Friday and I might need it Tuesday. I can either then adjust my own expectations or I can work with Pat on that. But I needed him to internalize his own real commitment before I was going to be able to get a real answer out of him. We get this every chance we can. Clarity, confirmation, and commitment. Again, this is all laid out in one of the opt-in sheets you would get from Lisa with RTI if you chose to opt into that. It'll lay out this place so that you can have the verbiage to get the three Cs. Clarity, confirmation, and commitment. Every time somebody comes to you to get you to do their job, or every time you go to delegate or assign a new task, anytime you're trying to get somebody to follow a set of details, you need to know what the details are and so do they. They need to say it back to you and they need to commit to implementing them or doing it differently. And then you're set up to actually hold them accountable. Afterwards, remember, you have that sequential process. This is what healthy leaders do. This is the culture you want to create in your organization. You set expectations, you hold people accountable. You set expectations, you hold people accountable. Every time you're setting expectations, you're empowering their own ideation and ability to solve their own problems. You're making it theirs. You're coaching them through improving it. You're getting confirmation from them. And when they don't do it, you're helping them level up their skill and their commitment. Your consistency teaches them to expect that. So they're going to perform better and better. And you're always reassigning the work to them. That's what gets them to do the job and you get your time back from it. Now, I want to get it now that I've gone through that framework a little bit with that in mind, the next poll here coming up, what percentage of the time do you feel like the challenges that you face stem from poorly set expectations? Give me a sense of now that you've thought through it this way, maybe you might even just ask yourself this question. What percentage of the time do you get your people to tell you what they're going to do instead of you telling them what they're going to do? Take a second. Let us know in the chat. I'd love to, under, in your poll, I'd love to understand that. We're going to jump in and I want to do a little bit, uh, a little bit of a skit here as well for this one here. This one's a little bit specific, but hey, Patrick, I noticed you didn't get the humidifier readings on today's monitoring. How about you only need to do that on the first day? So this is an instance where we didn't set very clear expectations with this person and Pat is operating under the wrong training or perception of that. This is going to happen quite often. This is an example of the type of thing we would have loved to have gotten confirmation from Patrick that he was going to do it every day, but we didn't. So we got to proceed from here. Well, Pat, look, we do need to, we need to gather this every day, but now that you do realize that that's what's expected, what can you do to make sure that that's a consistent part of what you're doing on this project? I want to make sure every time I go to do a moisture monitoring, I get the photos of the GPP and get the right measurements down. What's it going to take to, for you to remember that in the moment? I know it's busy, right? I know there's a bunch of stuff going on. The phone's ringing. It's messy. Like I get all that stress, but saying you're just going to do better next time, I believe you, but like, what do you need to do in your own mind to make sure you remember that that's what needs to happen? I'm going to make a little note of my work order. Make sure to get DHU readings. Perfect. I think that'd be a great idea. Again, Pat's pay playing super generous in the sandbox here. I pushed a little harder on that one, but it's an example of the type of conversation we have to have. Cause if we let that slide on this job, you're now signing up for every job moving forward. that Pat's going to forget that he was supposed to do the dehumidifier reading every single day. Okay. Lisa, are we turning this over to you? I'd like your thoughts or your input on the expectation setting here. Awesome. Thanks, Eric. Yeah. I want to just take this opportunity to start connecting this to our need to train people on documentation and actually train them to do anything we want people to do. That's the key to having them grow, be successful, engaged, and also our company's outcomes. And there's very much a connection between the language, a leader framework, and the concept of accountability and expectations that just went over. Uh, Eric just went over with us. So these skills apply and will help us get better uh, return on investments and impact from any of our training initiatives. And a lot of this that I'm going to touch upon is based on HPLJ methodology. That's a uh, high, uh, high performance learning journeys. And this approach has been based on 40 years of research and it's focused on workplace uh, training programs that are connected to people's job responsibilities and business outcomes. And so just as a real quick 
to tie it together. Um, when we, before somebody goes into any kind of training and intervention, whether it's in-house, in the field, a formal course you signed them up on, we can improve impact by clearly uh, defining what our expectations are the, of them from the training to the application of the job. And then one of the performance barriers I'm going to touch upon again later on is our ability to hold them accountable to applying the trainings to their training to their job. So you can see how this is all connected to not just our process, our day to day, but also even the impact and the ROI we get on training. And I'm going to continue as we go um, later in the program. I'm going to do a little bit more on this, but I'm going to use Applied Structural Drawing ASD as an example, because of all of our courses, that's where we we typically really do a major drill down on documentation. And by the end, everybody's super excited and engaged and understands why it's so important. And so what this may sound like, if I were to bring it all together in context of training, it may sound like, hey, Patrick, you're doing great. I want you to continue to grow in your position. Maybe become a crew chief. I'm gonna go ahead and sign you up for ASD. I want to help you um, understand the psychometry, the readings, the data you're collecting. I want you to be able to improve the thoroughness and consistency that you're gathering in your field documentation and eventually train others. I'm hoping this helps you better communicate the drawing plan and the progress to our customers and our key people internally, the project managers and the estimators. And by the way, it's going to also, this is all connected to helping our estimators uh, write the estimates more efficiently, accurately, and thoroughly. And that helps the company do better. And what I did there basically is I engaged them. I set some expectations around their the training applying to their job performance. And if you notice, I connected it to the business rationale. And I will talk more about that a little later. I think you had something to potentially share. Maybe you could add it to the uh, value setting clear expectations has had with you and your team. Maybe you've had a couple moments that are worth worth referring, uh, so, sharing. Doing the clarity, um, I don't know if we brought this up yet, but th there's going to be some uh, oh shit moments that you're going to have and your technicians are going to have. And mm -hmm. going through this, and the more I've done it, uh, I have a lot of these moments. And I realized that I wasn't being clear with my expectations. I thought I was, but I wasn't. An example that I have is that I had a technician. He's been with us for five years and a little over now. And listen, we're restoration industry. Okay. We get it. There can be some turnover and things like that. So having a guy there for five years is pretty good. And he was a steady Eddie kind of guy. Like he was that guy that like, Hey, if it hit the fan, he'd jump in to help after hours. He'd grab a weekend monitoring if we were busy, things like that. Like, so he was a good guy and he was worth investing in. The problem that I had personally was that he kept messing up on his moisture maps. He would miss measurements here. He'd have the wrong GPP. He would, you know, maybe not get the HVAC reading. And instead of addressing this with him, I would just fix it for him. I would look through photos. I would go and look through past sketches. I would Google what the weather was like that day back at two weeks ago to make sure that like the readings all made sense instead of actually addressing this or holding him accountable. And going through the academy, it struck me when it's like, not only was I not doing myself any favors, I was hurting him. I was holding him back. By not letting him know that he was doing something wrong and how to correct it, I wasn't giving him the chance to fix it and grow. And here in my mind, I think I'm helping him when I'm really just hurting him. And when I sat him down and we were able to have a conversation, I realized, and it's the term I also learned from Eric, there was a little bit of a skill gap that he had. Um, he was a good guy. Math wasn't his best subject. And he needed some help with doing some simple math to get some of the readings and get them, getting proper GPP. And it sounds really simple, but I sat down and we worked together and we, you know, we showed him, a, he had a calculator on his phone. He didn't even realize it. Uh, it's just something that's... And, you know, this guy's been doing it for this long and it's something that simple could have corrected some of these issues. And because I avoided it and I didn't hold him accountable, it just it, it took a lot more of my time away. 
Pat, that's such a good example, man. The calculator is such an honest one, right? And it's the type of thing that a person would very rarely admit, hey, I suck at math and I don't know which buttons to push in order to do this. Like your people are rarely going to tell you that, especially if they've been there for a little bit. And some of you may be thinking, do I really have to do all this? Like, are you kidding me? I got to show someone how to use the calculator on their phone. Well, look, I'll be honest. You don't have to. It's not your fault that they don't know how to do this stuff, but it is your responsibility to do something about it. And if you keep not helping them figure out that that literally the calculator button on their phone is what takes it for them to go from, I can't do this to I'll do this every time. You don't have to change anything, but there's an opportunity to really help them and help yourself a tremendous amount there. This stuff sometimes feels like, holy cow, I can't believe I have to do this, particularly for some generations, right? We can acknowledge there's different generational issues that you deal with. You don't have to engage in any of these things, but if you don't, all you're really saying is, this is never going to get any different. I'm just going to keep keep bashing my head into the same wall every single time. Most of it doesn't take that much if you're willing to engage in the conversation and put a little bit of practice into it so that you're able to do it in the right way. Okay, keep the Q&A coming. We're going to move on. I want to make sure we get to excuses here because it tends to be a hot topic. What the hell do I say when they don't play nice in the sandbox? What about when Pat says this? And what I want to share with you is that everybody makes excuses, yourself included. We may think we're the best people in the world at not making excuses at work. And then we go home and tell our spouse why it's not our turn to do dishes or cook dinner or get the kids or whatever. We're really, really good at making excuses. But once you know how to handle them, once you know what they are and what they aren't, you're going to realize that you never have to worry about it again. Again, not because they go away forever but because you know how to handle it and it's not that big of a deal. And when you start consistently handling your people's excuses, they'll stop using them. Now, I think one comment I meant to make earlier is that this, we talk about this a lot of times, these three secrets, like we're using them on the people that work for us, our direct reports, but it's really healthy to understand. You need to hold your peers accountable too. Sometimes you need to hold your boss accountable, your board accountable, your clients accountable, the insurance adjusters accountable. Like, you have a lot of opportunity to use this language in other ways than just with your direct employees or the people that you lead, especially if you're a project manager and you don't actually have authority over people, you need to hold them accountable. This stuff works in those examples. We haven't demonstrated it that way, but that's what we do in the academy. We'll help you show, show you how to use this in 360 degrees in your life so that that fear of holding your boss or your peer or your other PM or whoever accountable isn't that big of a deal anymore either. Let's get back into excuses. Look, everybody has them. There's something you need to know though, and that's that there are only four excuses in the world. That may stun some of you. I can't see your faces, but some of you might be sitting there going, oh, really? You've heard so many excuses, right? And you live in a world where there's a lot of stuff going on. So there's a, it's rife with opportunities for excuses, but there are only four. I didn't know there were only four. I didn't write a book saying there's only four and then go make them up. I just listened to enough people to start recognizing that they were all saying the same thing. And I wrote an ebook about it. It's called The Big Four Excuses and How to Deal with Them. And in that, that ebook, you're going to learn a play. This is going to teach you how to identify which excuse you're dealing with. Because if you know which one is coming, you'll know how to avoid the bait that's inherent in each of the excuses. And that's what excuses have. Big, juicy, real, honest bait. That's what makes them so effective. People are able to say something and you're kind of like, damn, that's actually a pretty good point. But well, that moment, they got you. And if you learn how to avoid that bait, then you learn how to not let them hijack the conversation. And instead you can address the excuse directly and redirect it into something that's far more productive. This ebook is included in the opt-in features as well. I cannot recommend this enough. It is a game changer in your day-to-day. -day. But let's talk about what uh, excuses really are here. You're going to learn that simple play to navigate excuses, but I want you to understand what they are a little bit here, okay? Excuses are a natural human phenomenon. We all make them. If you can just humanize for a moment and recognize that, yeah, you're frustrated that Bob keeps making those excuses, but okay, I've made some excuses too in my life. Excuses are what we do when we don't like the things we're going to have to say or admit. We use them to wiggle out of uncomfortable situations. I don't mean safety discomfort. I mean, Ah, it makes me, I don't like having to say that I did or didn't do that thing I was supposed to. This is what we all do. They are a natural human phenomenon. If you can empathize for just a half a second when you start to hear an excuse from somebody and go, oh, this person's trying to wiggle out of something. And instead of letting that make you mad, help them recognize what they really needed to be doing differently. That's what we're trying to do in this play. You're also going to recognize they're emotionally charged on both sides, right? You're pretty frustrated when Bob makes that same excuse for the same time. And he's probably pretty frustrated because he's uncomfortable. But they're also rarely well thought out, meaning if you can push past their first pushback, their first excuse, there's usually not some uh, well-constructed, deeply rooted, 
honest uh, reason they didn't do what they were supposed to underneath it. They're usually pretty thin. If you can be the, the mature one, the prepared one who recognizes, okay, this might get a little emotionally charged and then go actually use these, this uh, play, you'll be able to push past a lot of these excuses and find that your people are willing to change their behavior. I'm not saying everybody, I'm not promising you a magic bullet, but if you could reduce 30, 40, 60% of the excuses you deal with, it'd make a meaningful difference. And that's what we're talking about. Remember, they're meant to hijack the conversation and they're often a conditioned response. Look, every time Lisa accepts Pat's excuse for why something isn't done, Pat learns, oh, that works, cool. Next time that type of situation happens, all I have to say to Lisa is this, and I get off the hook. It's not Machiavellian. They're not sitting there like Mr. Burns. It's not manipulate. It's just how we work as people. We condition our people that their excuses will work. And this play is designed to undo that harm. Okay. Here are the four excuses. Number one, it's not my fault. Now, most adults don't actually say it this way. They aren't that petulant. They don't... Uh, they don't say it's not my fault in like a whiny way like that might happen, but it's pretty uncommon. What do they say? Most of the time they say things like, oh, the client didn't do this or the insurance adjuster didn't do that or this other thing happened or they, they, why isn't it their fault? They're saying it's somebody else's. The bait to avoid is whether it is their fault or not. Cause it's so tempting to say, well, yeah, it is. The way that we need to handle this is to share the hard truth with the person directly. Because reality is in your business, Kristen, there's going to be a lot of things that aren't your fault, but still are your responsibility. So what do you need to do to make sure that even though that happened, you're still able to follow through and get the signature? You're still able to get the photos taken. You're still going to go back and read the meter that you were supposed to have read. We're going to challenge them to redirect their thinking into something that's more constructive. Now, look, there's an art to how you deliver this, which is why we practice it. You might recognize that if I said, well, Lisa, you know, there's a lot of things in our business that aren't our faults that are still our responsibility. And if I pause there, what's Lisa going to do? She's going to hijack the microphone. She's going to double down on her excuse. She's going to start going. You can't do that. There's an art to the delivery of this address and redirect. Lisa, there's a lot of things that aren't going to be our fault, but look, they are still our responsibility. So what do we need to do to make sure that you're still able to follow through with that, even in this circumstance? You notice I'm being a little vague here, but you notice how I didn't leave any airtime between responsibility and my open-ended question. That's what that is, that redirect. That's the art in delivering and uh, handling an excuse. You're asking that person subtly to not focus on battling you and arm wrestling with you over the thing and instead to redirect their brain to solving how that problem won't hold them up again in the future. It's not my fault tends to be a very common excuse that we hear. The second one we tend to hear is I didn't know. It's amazing. You all know this. It's amazing. You could put a blinking billboard in front of the desk of one of your people telling them what they were supposed to do, and they would still find a way to tell you that they didn't know they were supposed to do it. We do all sorts of good things. We have them sign training documentation. We have them watch videos and get certificates and re-up. We have them do all sorts of stuff. Get CMEs or continuing education credits. Like Reality is you're never going to win an argument over what somebody does or doesn't know. And that's what you're trying to avoid debating. Even if they were in the meeting, even if they were copied on the email, you don't know if they read it or were paying attention. There's no value in debating what they should or should have known, even though it's the most frustrating thing. Cause you're like, it was in the email. I included it in your checklist or something like that. That's not going to help you. Instead, we're going to redirect their energy a little bit here. Hey, Lisa, now that you do know that you need to grab that dehumidifier reading every time, what are you going to do in the future to make sure that you don't forget about it? You heard me use an example of that earlier with Pat as we pivoted along the, uh, the, ex the example that we used for expectation setting. We're trying to get them to recognize, okay, you didn't know that, but you do now. What are you going to do about it? And then I would probably ask them to go finish the thing they didn't do before in the spirit of accountability. The third excuse we tend to deal with, I'm on it now. This one is sneaky because it doesn't feel like an excuse. It's a person telling you everything that you want to hear. Oh, don't worry, boss. I'll get it done now. Oh, I forgot. Thanks. I'm going to go get that. get right on that. We hear this all the time. And I got to be super clear about this one because there's some people that when they say it, you actually know they genuinely did just forget, but they're pretty accountable and responsible. And it was just a one-off mistake. With that person, that's not an excuse. That's an admittance of, okay, shoot, I forgot. I'm going to go do this. You know who that person is. You can picture them right now that if they said that, you'd be like, it's cool, it's just fine. But then there's everybody else. And anybody who's not earned that reputation of consistency, credibility, accountability with you, it's an excuse. They're buying time. And what you wanna do is redirect their energy. It's like a martial art. 
I don't do martial arts. I just know that there's some where like the whole point is to redirect the punch that is thrown at you. That's what we're doing here. This person wants to say they're going to go and do it now. Hot damn. That's exactly what I wanted them to do. But I don't quite believe them because they didn't already do it. Meaning I don't think they know what they're supposed to do. So I just want to ask one or two good open-ended questions here to make that person commit to a few details as opposed to just the overarching, I'll do it now. So what this sounds like is somebody says, oh, I didn't realize I'll go get that right now, boss. Hey, look, glad you're going to go do that. I'm glad you think it's important. But real quick, let me talk to you about how are you going to do X, Y, and Z? How are you going to get that, that signature from that homeowner? What's your voicemail going to sound like? When are you going to make that phone call? When can you fit it into your calendar to drive out there and get that? I'm going to make them answer one or two questions more to really pin down the details that they need to have figured out if they're going to be successful at doing the thing. And last but not least, there's that's not normal. This is a person who tries to gaslight you or convince you that what you saw, you didn't see that. Ah, oh, Lisa, that never happens. That was a weird one-off. That was a strange situation. It was a weird, that was a weird storm, weird homeowner. Weird. It's someone trying to convince you that the circumstances around the situation mean that what you saw or want to talk to them about doesn't matter. And you might have to share the hard truth that, hey, it's happening more often than you think. Or, hey, it's actually a really big deal, so we still need to talk to it. Or, especially in your world, nothing is normal. What do you mean normal? Like every job has its own nuance or detail or whatever. You don't live in a land of normal. So you might have to deliver that, 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 uh, that hard truth. Hey, Pat, everyone we do is a one-off man. I get that. But look, how are you going to make sure that even though there's no normal here, you're still able to be successful at checking all the boxes, getting the photos, whatever the thing might be. These are the four excuses that we deal with. Now, I'd really love to hear a fifth. So if you have a fifth, put it in there. I didn't intentionally pick four for marketing purposes. I just listened a lot and learned. Eh, they all say the same dang thing. No matter what industry they're in, what space they're in, doesn't matter. So if you have a fifth, throw it in there. I want to, I want to hear it. But these are the four that you deal with. And the good news is there are only four, which means you can learn this play with each of those. If there were 40, I wouldn't be able to teach this concept. It's too many if-thens. But when there's only four and you know you really deal largely with one or two, that's what I'd like to, to help you get better at. So take a second. We're going to put another poll up here. Which one of these do you deal the most? You probably deal with all of them to some degree, but which one really gets your goat or which one do you hear the most frequently on your team? The last thing I want to speak to a little bit is the redirect. As you're filling out that poll, the redirect, as I mentioned, is an art. How you say this matters. It is very much a part of the language of leadership. Because if I say to Lisa, well, what are you going to do now, Lisa? Well, she's going to feel like she's in the doghouse and all she's going to try and say is what she thinks I want to hear. I don't want to hear what I want to hear. I want to hear what she's actually going to go and do so we can get it to be the right thing so the damn job gets done. I don't need her to placate me. I need stuff to happen. It looks like we've got a pretty tight race there, but uh, I'm on it now and I didn't know where the common ones a little less, it's not my fault. And not a lot of that's not normal, which surprises me for your space, but like good for you all. That makes me really happy that that's not what you're dealing with. This redirect is a bit of an art. I need this person to say out loud what they think they should do. And if you were paying attention early, you might recognize that's the first step in the three C's. What do they think they need to do? I'm going to ask them an open-ended question to get them to come up with their own idea so that I can then help them improvement, get them to commit to doing it and go out and get it done and hold them accountable. This fits right into the cycle of leadership we build with our people. And good open-ended question starters begin with these words, who, what, when, where, or how. You'll notice I don't include the word why because why is the fastest way to get somebody to be defensive. Why'd you do that, Kristen? Your, the, the excuse track will leave the train the moment you start asking a question with the word why. It's the fastest way to get somebody to be defensive. But these open-ended question starters are what allow a person to think on their own and have to answer and engage their brain to think about a detail and share an open-ended answer with you. If you start the questions with did you or have you, those are closed-ended and all they're going to say is what they think you want to hear. These are powerful question starters that we use in the redirects so that the person takes ownership over the thing they're supposed to do and that we can then get them to say what they're going to do so we can hold them accountable to it. I'd love your thoughts about it, uh, holding, or, uh, setting, uh, using these excuse handlers. But reality is you're going to get pushed back. Your people are going to fight back. In fact, you're going to use one and think you nailed it and they're going to switch and they're going to use a different excuse. And that's okay. That's normal. That's why we practice it. The best way to get good at any of these things is to spend a little time role-playing them with us so that it just becomes normal and built in and it's muscle memory and you don't have to worry about it anymore. We're going to recap how this works. This whole system works real fast and then we're going to do a little panel as well. 
You got to start by changing the way that you and your team think about accountability so that you can consistently give them feedback, help them grow, get expectations set on the front end, hold them accountable when they don't do it, handle their excuses so that they start doing their own dang jobs. If you can be consistent in this, they will adapt their behavior to you. Not perfectly, not 100% of your people, but those who don't, you will figure out what you want to do with them, whether they should be on the bus or not. But you can't do any of this if you don't make some changes. Okay, let's talk about a quick example of this. Let me demo this with you here, Pat. So, Pat, oops, where'd my uh, example go? Apologies. Oh, yeah. Nope, I lost it. Sorry. There it is. Pat, I noticed that you didn't document the time frame that we can actually monitor for tomorrow. Well, I couldn't text you. My phone died. That happens, man. Look, I get it. We run on our phones all day long, but reality is we still have to be accountable to this, even though technology failed us in this particular instance. What do you need to do in order to make sure that your phone doesn't die on future projects like that? Well, I usually charge my phone overnight. I mean, I guess you could probably keep a charger in the truck if that helps. Yeah, look, if you don't have one of those already, I highly recommend that. Get a charger, put it in your truck. Not being able to text me isn't a good reason for us to not have the documentation we need. Otherwise, we can't get paid. Can you go uh, back? Are you able to go back and figure out what time frame we actually can test tomorrow? Yeah, I'll give them a call right now and I'll let everybody know. Cool. Again, Pat's being super nice. We're uh, playing well in the sandbox here, but that is what it sounds like. Most of the time, handling an excuse doesn't sound or feel as contentious as we often fear that it will. Pat, what's your experience been like trying to use handle the excuses of your people and how have you noticed them changing if you've consistently started uh, putting this stuff to use? I gotta be honest, when like you first see the excuses, I'm sure this probably resonates with a lot of people. You're like, oh crap. Like not only have you heard all these excuses, I've made these excuses for my people. That was the problem. <laughs> and I conditioned them that like, not only are they making excuses to me, I'm making excuses for them. And a lot of it was like, hey, they didn't get the overall pictures. Well, they don't know to take overall pictures from the room. They don't know to take the realtor shots. Oh, that's good enough. Hey, they didn't uh, you know, document that there's seven layers of flooring that were removed. Well, they don't know to, I would say they don't know how to do that. I would make excuses for them. And it was this spiral we would have that I was just cleaning up all these messes and things like that. And learning these and actually being in the academy and practicing it, it's gotten better. I will tell you the first time you do this and when you have a conversation with somebody, they're going to look at you like you have three heads. One of my guys who's been here for 15 years, I came out and I was, and I used some verbiage and a skit with him. And he looked at me and he goes, you look like you just came out of a, you sound like you just came out of a seminar. Like it just, <laughs> it wasn't natural. Like, cause my tone wasn't right. Like, but it, so the more I practiced, I was able to adapt it. And now we use it so much. I literally had an instance right before this uh, webinar that we had a guy bring a truck back and it wasn't properly stocked and field ready. And I had to talk to him about this and I'm talking to him about this. And he gave me an excuse. He said, well, it's back the way I found it. And I had to explain to him like, okay, well, often things that aren't our fault. And he stopped me, he goes, are our responsibility. Like, Cause I've used this so much with like, he understood. And he's I was like, okay, so what are you going to do? He's like, I'm going to get my guy, my other guy to come back with me right now. We're going to restock the truck. That's great. What are you going to do in the future? I'm going to make sure it's field ready. Every time we bring it back, it won't happen again. But it was just, it gets more natural and you make it your own style. Um, the thing that like where it says that's not normal, we've kind of worded it to like, it's kind of, I'm sure this has happened before. What did we do before when this happened? And you kind of get a better response out of it. You've done such a good job of using that. That example with the truck is hilarious. When your people start to finish your sentence for you, it means you've been consistent enough that they know it's coming. And look, you don't want to do this with everything. You don't want to lose your personality, your humor, your humanity, your relationships by doing this stuff this rigidly. But it is what probably made that a heck of a lot easier, Pat, than those conversations would have gone maybe six months ago when that guy didn't know you were going to say that and he was trying to use the excuse and he expected to be able to get off the hook and he thought that if he returned it in a poor state just because the previous guy did it poorly, it'd be fine. Now that's not the case anymore. I'm really pleased with how well you've grown in that way. Good job, man. Lisa, anything to add about excuses? Should we jump yeah, no, into I think Patrick, uh, training? I, Patrick said it well. I'll add, and you mentioned it, Patrick, that we didn't even realize till we, we didn't learn just 
how to handle them, but we also learn to identify ourselves giving them or making them for our people. And I think one of the big takeaways for both of us was like, we didn't realize how many excuses were even happening internally, externally. And you not only get to identify, and Eric, it is literally hard to believe when you hear it the first time that there's four. Me and Patrick, now that we can be excuse police and identify them and bucket them, we have not found one that didn't fit in the four, Eric. I can confirm that. I'm always hunting. I'm looking yeah. for an excuse. I'll write another book. It'd be right. great. <laughs> Let's transition a little bit. Look, these skills are incredibly impactful, but they do really require you to put a little effort into it. Not a ton, but you have to recognize if you go change nothing, nothing will change. You got to change how you hold people accountable, how you set expectations, how you handle their excuses. And you need to change the value you bring from being the chief problem solver and excuse maker and to learning how to hold your people accountable and develop their talent. You've got great people. What's happened is you've conditioned them that they don't have to do their own job and you've kind of neutered their own ability to go grow. If you can flip that around, you'll really be able to have a powerful team and you'll get a tremendous amount of your time back or you'll grow the organization or you'll improve your performance. Whichever one of those things is most interesting to you. And there's great news. This program, I've been doing it for four years. We help leaders customize this language and make it theirs. In the partnership with RTI, you can come and practice these skills in a safe space because if you go use them and practice them in the real world, that's live ammo, baby. That gets a little complicated. But if you come try it a couple times, you realize it isn't that scary and you'll be ready to go put it to use and start to condition your people like Pat has. We're going to transition over. Lisa, the floor is yours. Thanks, Eric. So what I'm here to talk about a little bit today is just tying some of this, give you some training tips. And I'm going to go pretty fast. Some of it is actual documentation training. We have a lot of resources around documentation, uh, job aids, tools to help with the learning process, and also Eric's programs, his ebooks, and his quick reference guide. So um, I just want to remind everybody you can get everything you need. And if there's anything we didn't go deep dive, you can reach out to us and we can probably find you some resources. So management engagement in a lot of Eric's curriculum in the language of leadership speaks to our skill and ability to engage accounted for 70% of impact on the job from Professor Brinkerhoff's research. And he's the creator of the High Performance Learning Journey, my workplace training hero. And he did a very deep dive study and this was one of his findings. And so on the next slide, I want you to understand what is impact because you know we, we often get hung up on this word ROI, return on investment. Well, we can't get a return on investment until we create impact. So. Think of this process of we have a training intervention and open your minds to this could be your in-house. This includes you're going to go uh, train in the field with a team leader. So everything I'm going to go over in this concept applies to everything, e-learning, going to an IICRC class, whatever the program is. And we're acquiring knowledge, skills, new attitudes, new behaviors. Hopefully we all did some of that today. We started training. And then we're going to take the, this knowledge, skills, new behaviors, and we're going to apply it to our actual job and perform well. That application to our job and performance well, performing well, contributes to a business objective, our business rationale, our goals, our strategies, and then we can celebrate. And this seems pretty cut and dry, but the better we understand this process, the better we can manage it and create better results. And I just want to take one moment on that business objectives, because it, this is something a lot of us, and I think it's um, an issue in a lot of our organizations, is we have a little bit of a disconnect of the team that's gathering the field documentation and office staff and office responsibilities, maybe project managers and how it all connects. So when we're, we're able to start engaging people on their training and, and connecting all these dots to their job, their specific performance and how it's contributing to the bigger picture to the other team members and our business objectives, it's going to help connect in what I call organizational awareness. How does my job and how I'm executing it impact our operation and the other people in this organization. So real quick on the next slide, I'm just going to uh, hit where I'm going to do give some quick tips. I'm going to talk about engagement, 
mitigating performance barriers that we're not going to go through them all, but there's a QR code there. You can get our free pre-recorded um, pre-recorded webinar, Unlocking Learning Excellence, and that's going to get you a deeper dive into some of these elements and also more tools and resources to help you with this specifically the training process. And so on the next slide, you're going to see this is where I my approach has been asked this question for years. How do you train somebody to, and if you give me a clip, and in this place, we are saying, how do I train somebody to collect all the information on day one? And so everybody always wants me to give them a super fast, easy answer. And then I kind of go, well, what do you want them to do? And everybody, uh, and then what skills and knowledge? Because when we say we want them to document, do we want them to be able to set the protocol document um, understand all the materials, make decisions on site, be able to communicate the documentation to a homeowner internally, communicate the drawing progress, or do we just want them to literally collect the piece of data and then put it in? So we have to then, once we determine that, and we then we need to identify the skills, knowledge, experiences that we need to meet those objectives. And I just wanna give you a quick tip, and there's more resources in that training uh, program we have together. We have a skill set matrix. But as you and your team start to think this through as it pertains to documentation or anything else, um, bucket knowledge, like Eric starts, he has a saying, and we were both using some of these words before we even start working together. Knowledge is great, but skill is cool. He, that's his saying. Well, the way I want you to think of knowledge when you're really breaking it down nitty gritty, it's like, yeah, we know something, but there is things we need to know to do our jobs. So in your workplace around documentation, it may be something as simple as, can they do readings if they don't know where the meters are? And you're more, no. What if the batteries die? How do they requisition or get batteries? And these things sound stupid, but this is knowledge we need and we need to transfer it so somebody can do their job well. And then categorize those skilled things that we may need to practice, learn, do, repeat, collect feedback, and I'm going to show a quick graphic. So we want to look at the skills the individual brought. Maybe they had some experience because we don't, we want to go as, we want to be able to pat them to proficiency as quickly as possible. And we also don't want to disengage them by teaching them how to use a meter that they've already have experience using for five years. So we want to look at it that way. And then it becomes a formula. Now we know what we need to train them on. We can pat them. We can celebrate and recognize some of the milestones. Oop, I think we got a slide ahead, Eric, if you can just flip back for me. Back oh, I'm sorry. That, sorry. That's okay. Celebrate those milestones. That's what I was kind of speaking to. And then we just review and um, adjust. Now, on the next slide, this is an example of a documentation learning path that we built out um, with some of our e-learning. But I just want to give, again, as you said, think about what do they need to be able to do as skills and your knowledge transferred to document well? You'll notice one of the things on there is measuring. So we don't want to take for granted that, oh, I can just show you how to take a picture well. Well, maybe taking a picture well, I think it is a skill. My kids tell me I'm the worst photo taker ever, and I'm not allowed to take their picture. So photo taking may be a skill that we have to practice, but measuring, we don't want to make those assumptions. Patrick gave you that scenario that may be something we need to train so we really need to think through our expectations and then on the next slide i'm just going to give you a quick little story of engagement commitment and clarity and it's going to give you kind of a picture of how this is so important and i'm going to go back to our asd example and it may uh, in the chat box i'm going to ask you which learner do you think is going to have the best outcome after their training intervention? So they went to an ASD class and the learner number one comes in and I say, why are you here? And they say, um, I don't know. My supervisor just told me that I need to take ASD and here I am. I go, okay. So now let's go to learner number two. Learner number two says, well, um, my goal is to become a crew chief and I my, my supervisor signed me up for the class. Okay. Now, learner number three may say, well, I'm a crew chief, and some of the things that I sat down with my supervisor, 
And they want me to be able to have a better understanding of the documentation, the psychometry, have more confidence and understanding to make decisions when I'm monitoring a water loss to adjust the drying plan, improve my communications to the customers, adjusters, and our internal key people. Who is going to be most engaged in the learning process in, and applying it to their job? I see one person put number three. That's right, number three. So on the next slide, we're gonna, I'm just gonna do a quick recap here. And we need to, Eric gave us a really good lesson on the importance of, he calls this three C's. We have the same thing when we're, we're trying to create impactful training and being supportive of their training journey, engaging them and make people excited for their careers and be able to do a good job. And one, it starts with what are their job responsibilities and clarity, and we want to be able to connect it. I just gave the crew chief, or somebody wants to be a crew chief, but if an estimator goes to an ASD class, they're going to have very different job responsibilities. We still want to make that connection because that's what we call, based on HPLJ, it's not he who learned the most, it's he who learns the most strategically is the best outcome. So I can take that same course if I have clarity around how it applies to my job responsibilities and have a great impact. Expectations of applying training and what's in it for that. Go ahead on the next slide. We're going to kind of go pretty fast here. Bottom line is number three, you can keep clicking, is the, the goal here. So I do want to just touch upon this concept of barriers. So a barrier in the implementation of training is anything that's going to prevent somebody from applying that training to their job. So on, I'm going to um, ask the question of everybody on the next slide, can barriers become enablers? What does everybody think? If we're aware of them and proactively managing them, absolutely. We can turn those barriers into enablers and improve the impact in ROI. So on the next slide, I'm going to give you some generic categories, and I'm just going to touch base on a few of them and kind of connect some of these dots here. If a person, um, when you look at resources, we need the tools, we need meters to do the reading. We need an operable phone. Probably not an iPhone 4 is the best for this day and age. So those are tools. We may need software is a helpful tool to put all that documentation in. Those are resources that help us apply the training. If we learn these things, how to take a good picture, and we don't have a tool to take a good picture, we only go back to work or have uh, the meter to do the reading or the meter's broken, we can't apply the training. And the other one is work design. So that's process guidelines, and that's connected to Eric's CCC. How clear are we? If we teach theoretical standards of care in an ASD, but there's no process and workflows that it fits into, it becomes a barrier for them to apply those training, that training. On the next slide, you're going to see all I did was just kind of in my own words, um, bring uh, forward a couple of the things that I see that I think are some of the biggest barriers in the day-to-day -day in our restoration organizations. And it's going to vary by organization. Eric, accountability, that's part of why I love this program. It's not just on our outcomes or implementing strategy. It's also even our ability to hold people accountable on the application of training, huge barrier. Peers, I want to bring this one up, is that, go back to ASD. It could be we train them to take uh, how important, and they're very passionate about getting those grain depression readings and those uh, outside atmospheric reading conditions, uh, atmospheric readings, and they come back. It could be they got trained on their new software. They come back and their supervisor's rolling their eyes. Oh boy, over zealous data gather. Or their peers are, you don't really have to take that. Nobody does anything about it here. They don't really care. How much value, impact, and return did we get on that training if that happens? So I want to bring those things to attention on the next slide. I already talked about this a little bit. This is part of why this concept in skill development is also why there's a leadership academy for us to practice. But it applies to all those things around documentation that we um, categorize as a skill. 
We want to learn, do, repeat, collect feedback, and we continue that cycle until we are confident, proficient, can self-evaluate, self-correct, and mentor others. That's the formula for skill development. And I want to just highlight one thing that time from learn to do is of critical importance. And if we train somebody on how to use the meter, how to use our company's software system, how to use um, anything, and six months go by before they have the opportunity to apply it, we just dramatically decrease the impact in their ROI. So we need to be proactively managing the time span between their opportunity to learn and to do. And these are just a couple of quick resources we're just going to flip through quick that when you opt in, you'll get, you're going to get coaches tip list. It's going to, there's even a blank. You can fill in some of your own. You're also going to get our leverage learning uh, worksheet that helps you connect super easy, efficient. I bet if you start using it, you can engage in less than 15 minutes before and after. It helps all some of those concepts and everybody stay on the same page on their training. On the next page, you're gonna see one of the samples of it, um, uh, our simple steps. And this is for monitoring a water loss. You're also gonna get the first day. This is a process. So you're gonna get process throughout the process. It's very clearly marked where they should be documenting. So this is generic to serve all resources. So you're free to download it, use it as a tool to tweak and develop your own, make it your own. On the next page, one of the other resources is going to be an extensive um, job documentation checklist that's categorized. And you can kind of click through that one. It's all one slide there, Eric. And what I encourage you to do, Eric talked about Clarity and Patrick did. Oh boy, they didn't know. This is a great uh, tool. Again, there's a lot of categories that to almost start from scratch or you can use it as a job aid, use it as um, a training aid, but you can also do it as an activity after this and say, everybody check what you're responsible for by these categories. And it's gonna give us that opportunity to proactively clarify who's getting what piece of information for that job story, that job documentation, and help bring everybody together. Okay, thank you guys. I know I went pretty fast and I'll turn it back over to Kristen for some Q&A there. Perfect. Uh, so we did have a question come in. Um, how can we change field text line of thinking when it comes to documentation? A lot of our techs think documentation should only be office and management's problem. I'm happy to chime in on that in a general sense, because this is, has to do with how you change somebody's mind in general, right? This is any organizational change that you struggle with. So this specific example is a really good one, but it's also representative of a larger category of struggles that we have as leaders is that the person I'm asking to do something doesn't think it should be their job or is important. So somewhere in there is the need to set the clear expectation that it is their job and to be able to get them to vocalize back that they understand that it is indeed their job. But somewhere deeply rooted in there is an answer to the question, what's in it for them? And we don't have time to get in that today, but it's one of the critical things we work on in the academy is getting good at helping somebody recognize what's in it for them is usually the switch that has to go on to get somebody to say, that's dumb, I shouldn't have to do it. Two, ah, that's pretty important. I should make sure I take care of that. And as a simple example, in this case, you're never going to promote or give a promotion or a raise or more responsibility to a tech who isn't doing all the things they think that they're expected of them. That could be something that's in it for them. Not being able to keep their job is sometimes what's in it for them. Now, hopefully that's not our primary motivator. I'm really not a big fan of that particular stick or carrot, but sometimes that does get that far. There's always something that's in it for somebody to change behavior our job as leaders is to get good at helping them connect those dots so that instead of the reason that they do it is because I said so, it becomes because they want to get to that next level or they care about the margins on a job or they're bought in on the brand or 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 getting good at understanding what's in it for them is the the answer to that question. Yeah, awesome. And I'll add just on the again on the training side, if you notice, I I connected um how their job connects to the office. So it's not one or the other, and that's not uncommon. And that uh, job documentation checklist is a great tool to kind of start over and bring everybody together around that. But also the sooner we get consistent, some of these things we're on doing, 
the sooner we can put things and be very clear with the responsibilities from day one when they first start, the less of these battles we have. Wonderful, thank you. Um, another question is, how do I avoid micromanaging as I try to implement these strategies? Great question. First answer, uh, make them say it back to you on the front end so that you know what they're going to do rather than you micromanaging what they're going to do. Let them tell you. And sometimes you got to push a little bit, but the second, third, fourth time, they're going to know what's coming and they're going to start laying out what they're going to do. And then when they don't do it, ask them that series of questions each and every time. Your consistency at holding them accountable and making them finish the job is what will make them rapidly get better so that you feel less compelled to micromanage because that's where it comes from. We feel anxiety that if I don't do this, shit's not going to get done. Well, you're right. But if you hold them accountable once or twice, it'll start getting done and it won't be your, your job to do it anymore. Anything to add to that, Lisa? No, I think that was well said. I actually, uh, somebody just typed down if we have time for that one, an actual example. And Eric's so good at scripting it out. <laughs> I'd love for him to hit that one. <laughs> Perfect. Ah, Lisa, your people are so clever. Great one. Leslie Eschbach wrote that there are people <laughs> who forget documentation so that they can go back and get it. And I would imagine OT can be a real motivator in some of these instances. And oftentimes it was things they knew they needed presented in other people's projects in no time. What's the best way to address that? Well, look, if you get a sense that someone's a repeat offender, that's how I would think about this situation. This is someone who's repeatedly violating your expectations. That's a different language than accountability, right? Accountability is when somebody screwed up. It's the time they honestly forgot to do that. Whether they should or shouldn't have is not the point. When someone is manipulating the situation for their own gain, they are very much violating my expectations. And that's a different talk track. We didn't get to talk about it today, Lisa, but in the course, in the academy, in the program, we talk about this skill called conflict. And it's an escalated version of dialogue where a person has violated your expectations and you need to be able to speak clearly and succinctly to it and get them to commit to change. That would be my answer for you, Lisa. We have conflict about it. We pull out of the shadiness, the darkness that they're secretly doing this non nonsense. They're doing it on purpose. How do you say that? How do you get them to admit to it? How do you have that conversation? It's all what we practice in the academy. But the answer lies in you have to have a different type of conversation. You can't let it go unsaid anymore or everybody else knows it too. And you probably watch that problem spread like wildfire where someone else gets savvy and now needs OT to go back and get it as well. That's a long-winded answer, Lisa, short version. Have conflict before it spreads. That would be the nature of how I would address it. Um, I think we're at time. Um, so if you just want to move on to the next slide. Yeah, happy to. We couldn't cover everything today, but here's what we did cover. What do you say when someone doesn't do what they're supposed to, does it later, does it poorly? You're going to see a talk track like that if you opt in. I highly encourage it. How do you set expectations with people on the front end so that they're more likely to do the job? Way cooler when your people just do what they're supposed to than when you have to hold them accountable. There's a healthy framework for it. That's also included in the opt-in. And what do you say when they make excuses? Because you know they're going to. We all do. But if you can be prepared to handle that, you won't feel as much anxiety around it. And you'll, you know, like Pat mentioned, your people will just know what's coming and they'll stop using those excuses as much. We go, there's a lot more in the program. We couldn't get to all of it, but hopefully those three things, plus the training tips have put you in a better position to get your people to do the damn documentation thing. There's a lot of resources available to you. There's some QR codes there. You're going to get this emailed back to you. You're going to get the chance to opt in and see all of the different ways in which you could grow in this. There's a lot of free resources. There's several paid resources. We want to help you grow here. Make sure you opt in. It's going to be really beneficial for you. Thanks to everybody for joining us today. You're going to receive a follow-up with all of these things you could opt into. So I highly recommend you take the time to go ahead and do that. You'll see a few emails from us. I think from a timing expectation, you're going to see that feedback uh, email in about a week or inside of a week. And then everybody who opts in from there can expect to receive that from RTI uh, the following week. Thank you so much for your time today. We know you're busy. You've got a lot of things to do. Hopefully you took one thing out of this. If anybody needs to stick around, I think we'll be here for a minute or two longer, but otherwise have a great rest of your day. Go get your people to do the damn documentation thing. Thank you so much for coming. Thank you, everybody. Thanks, Beautiful. Guys. Thanks, everyone.